Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Hi, and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast. Those of us who grew up in the 1970s and 80s will remember hearing that All in the Family or Who's the Boss or Happy Days was, quote, filmed in front of a live studio audience. I recall wishing that I could one day be a part of that studio audience, and today that wish comes true, sort of. We're coming to you from the 2019 State Bar of Texas Annual Meeting in Austin. Our podcast today is being sponsored by LawPay, trusted by more than 35,000 law firms to accept legal payments online. It's the only payment solution offered as a member benefit by the State Bar of Texas. We're in day two of the annual meeting, and our guest today is the keynote speaker for the Adaptable Lawyer Track. He is a president of Keller Williams Realty. He is not a lawyer. So you might ask, why is he here? Well, sometimes, many times, we can learn from innovators across industries. Today's guest is just that kind of innovator. His name is Josh Team. Please help me in welcoming him. Well, Josh, thanks for being here. So I must admit, real estate is, is not exactly the first industry that comes to mind when I hear the word innovation, right? We usually think about technology, you know, maybe we think about some kinds of consumer goods. I watch Shark Tank, there's, there's nice innovations on there sometimes. Is change of foot in the real estate industry? Talk to us about that. Yeah, so absolutely. The, but I think it's not just the real estate industry. I think, you know, if you look around uh, the entire, uh, you know, in all industries right now, every habit that consumers have is being challenged for, to create new disruptive habits for consumers, whether it's how you find a, a, a taxi, whether it's how you find where you're going to stay on vacation, whether it's medical procedures, whether it's financial advice, um, and real estate. And, and what's happening is there's a lot of uh, uh, private equity money that's going in to try to take uh, market cap from any of these, these, these verticals. And so any industry right now that has a large portfolio of uh, revenue opportunity, if you will, uh, is, is up for grabs to being disrupted. And real estate is one of the largest asset classes uh, in the country. And so there's a lot of money in the tune of about, I think, three to four billion dollars a year going in just to try to disrupt and create new habits in real estate right now. Now, you've not always been in, in real estate. So you've, you've, had a, you've had quite a path getting to here. So let's talk about how today happened. What was your professional journey that got you to Keller Williams? <laughs> So, As you chuckle. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's funny because when you, you ask the question, you know, uh, real estate doesn't come to mind when you think of innovation and technology, and, and I agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> four years ago, uh, when Keller Williams reached out and we started having conversations about me potentially joining Keller Williams, um, I didn't, I had the same first, first thought, which was real estate. Because um, prior to that, I was uh, uh, the chief innovation officer for a company called RAP, which is uh, basically the Om- Omnicom a large conglomerate of uh, advertising agencies, and you work with Fortune 50 companies. But to, to roll all the way back, uh, I've been programming since I was 12, 13 years old. Um, I was you mean old. like source coding? Yeah, like actually yeah. programming a computer. Okay, a- Absolutely. So when my friends were into you know, Marvel Comics and uh, these other things, I just was, was really passionate about writing uh, software. And uh, I became... You must have been the coolest kid on your block growing you, up. You know, uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> the... Uh, so when I was 13, 14, I became one of the largest open source contributors in, the, in, in, in my, my area. That got me um, able to get into more projects. And so that kind of self-fulfilled itself into, um, I went to college. Again, I, was, uh, I couldn't watch a rated R movie when I first went to, to college. And so you're not the coolest kid in college when you can't see a rated R movie. It's just, uh, it, was, it was too young still. And so Some that, people say I like the maturity to watch a rated R movie. So yeah. maybe, we're, <laughs> there we go. maybe we're on the same page. So I was uh, uh, so I, I coded even more in school, and then long story short, I, my life got into a crossroads where I had to decide, you know, which path to go. And um, someone, uh, company, Lending.com, recruited me out of, out of school. So when I was 16, 17, I went to start working for Lending.com, building um, software. That got me into building software for large 
companies, and then I went to the consultancy route, and long story short, uh, went and created the first kind of innovation division, if you would, where we'd go to Fortune 50 companies and um, help them with digital technology innovation on how to take market share or, to, or defend against a disruptor or whatever their business challenge was. Um, Keller Williams, who uh, was knee deep in an evolving industry that was being challenged, again, billions of dollars pouring in to try to disrupt everything. Um, and they, they were asking a question, you know, how would we reinvent ourselves for the, the next decade? And so that was an interesting business challenge. And so uh, I joined about four years ago, and it's been a uh, pretty awesome ride, like I said. And we've, we've climbed to number one in every category of real estate. So let's talk for a second about the impetus at Keller Williams for the, for the innovation. What kind of got them to start scratching their heads? Was it just the fact that private equity money was going into the space, or was there some other business reason behind it? Yeah, so, and this is where I think this applies uh, specifically to you know, any professional services, whether it be legal or marketing or anything. You know, we fundamentally believe that, I mean, not just we, like the, the collective we is like, the, you know, Harvard writes about it. Um, we're in what they're calling the fourth industrial revolution, meaning that there's only been three other in the history of the planet where data, technology, and AI is infused into every vertical, every category. And you can see whether they're successful or unsuccessful, there's organizations, money, energy, trying to use the technology and data to create new consumer habits and um, new business habits. And so that's happening across the spectrum. And so Keller Williams was asking the question, Given this to be to be true, you know, how are we going to play in that space, and what will the impact be into how contracts are written on homes, and um, how consumers are finding and evaluating their offers, and like, like what are the what are the impacts that this is going to have, the, the fourth industrial revolution is going to have in real estate, and then specifically with Keller Williams, and then how can we position ourselves to be at the forefront um, of that change? So let's let's again focus on Keller Williams for just a second. What what types of innovative solutions has Keller Williams been kind of toying with? Or at least what can you talk about that Keller Williams has been toying with? Yeah. And, you know, how successful has it been? Because that might give us a blueprint for talking about law and lawyers. So let's, let's talk for a second about Keller Williams' journey along that path. Where, where have you found changes and disruptions? And which of those have been successful or at least appear to be successful at this point? Yeah, so, well, now you're going to get into, you know, there's different str strategic views of this, but um, I'm a firm believer that data is the fuel of creative new experiences. This is what makes Uber so powerful. This is what makes Netflix so powerful. It's what makes Spotify and even Facebook and all their bad, you know, press are getting right now. It's that they have so much data that they can create curated, individualized experience for the consumer. I joke for, you know, when I speak, there's, there's two things, two ways of looking at, at, at data. And the truth is, when we all talk about, you know, the idea these companies are collecting all of our data, we talk about how creepy that is. But the truth is, the difference between creepy and cool is value. So the fact that uh, when I get in my car in the morning and Apple says, hey, it looks like you're going to work, here's the fastest route to go to work, it's kind of creepy that they know, like, I'm going to work and they know where I work and they know all this information. I never told them that. But because they're going to show me the best way to get there, that's also kind of cool. And so mm. there's value there. And, and, and so it's when that value exchange isn't, real, isn't, isn't equitable is when that data collection turns into consumer issues. And so um, long story short to say this is that when I first got to KW, uh, we went on a data. Uh, we, we completely re-engineered re our infrastructure to support more connected data. We went out and built data alliances with companies like Google and Nextdoor that were in uh, adjacent verticals that were not direct competitors but had more data on real estate as a whole. And we've started to connect all of that data together to create better experiences for the consumer. So one of the things we did is if you're not familiar with Nextdoor, they're a, um, a basically a, they're a social media site for neighborhoods. So they've mapped out 230,000 neighborhoods in the country. Well, Keller Williams has a relationship with MLSs that looks at cities. Um, so we took our next door data plus the KW data plus the MLS data and we mix all that together so that we can allow the consumer with one click to see what's happening in their hyper local neighborhood. And so that was a small innovation that allowed the consumer to ask real estate questions in a different way and see insights like I don't care what's happening at the city level or the zip code level, my two block neighborhood 
what are home prices doing in my, in my very specific neighborhood? And what are other homes like mine doing um, based off photo recognition? So that's one example of innovation that we've seen a lot of really good success from. But ultimately, um, what we're doing is we're trying to collect and accumulate as much data as possible around um, the, the, the transaction in real estate and to create new consumer experiences. Okay, so you, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about, about collecting data. Now, let's just, let's just do a straw poll with, with the folks that are in our live studio audience. You, you know, how many of you guys are, are with, with large firms, big firms? Okay, so we've got about, I think, three or four hands up. How many of you are with small firms? Okay, we got a few more hands up. How many of you are solo practitioners? Okay, about an equal number of hands up there. And how many of you are not with firms? You guys might be in-house counsel with companies. Okay, so we got a few of those. So the in-house lawyers might be working at entities that could call up Google and get a phone call returned. I know if I called Google and said, I wanna share data with you, they probably would laugh and then hang up the phone if they even pick up the phone. So how do, how do we, let's talk about lawyers and the, the practice of law. How do you think your experience at, at Keller Williams and, and innovation and data collection, how can, how can we as lawyers try to harness some of that? Or, or do we need to look at innovation from a different perspective in your view? Yeah, so I mean, I, I mean there, there, there's two ways to answer that question. The, I absolutely believe that like every other industry, data will empower um, fiduciary service providers such as attorneys to make to be better consultants, better fiduciaries, because you can leverage technology to do more, more things faster. But that's a different conversation. I think what I, I think I'm more apt to talk about is um, I actually believe um, we just we've gone through um, the, and, and have evaluated our firms and, and are in relationship with different partners. I actually firmly believe that smaller f shops have a unique opportunity for the next several years to take more large clients off the table from, from larger firms. Okay, I think that's gonna get people's ears perking up. A lot of folks looked up all of a sudden that were in the audience. They were checking their phones and they looked up and they said, smaller <laughs> firms have a bigger opportunity. So let's, let's get into that a little bit because our audience here is, is mixed. And you know, a lot of times at these, we have mostly solos and small firms. We actually have a very healthy mix of people across the legal spectrum. So. Talk to us about what is the opportunity for the smallers and the smaller firms and the solo practitioners. Yeah, so in my mind, there's two types of legal uh, issues. So, so when I'm working with you know my general counsel uh, and uh, my leadership team, there's two types of legal issues that, that come uh, uh, arise: um, the, lar the longer tail, the you know the class action lawsuit type stuff. That's a multi-year project, and, and I think the the bigger firms are still positioned better. For the for, you know the top companies to to work in those cases when they're long predictable, um, you're going to want as much firepower as possible as a, as a large corporation. However, what's happening is at, on on all these other projects, which is these companies. So again, billions of dollars across every industry is coming in to quote unquote disrupt everything, and what and their and the cycles of innovation are getting more compressed. So what happens here is that puts immense pressure on incumbents. So imagine, and this is one of the advantages that startups have, this is one of the advantages that smaller companies have, is that their, their, their risk threshold and their speed to market is so incredibly fast that they can outmaneuver the larger companies. So the larger companies are trying really hard right now to combat these disruptors and incumbents. So rather, whether it be Disney trying to compete with Netflix, whether it be um, um, Hilton trying to compete with Airbnb, and the and and an example and, and the the cycles of innovation, like a month is a really really long time when you're looking quarter to quarter. And so um, I believe in those in in, in, in that context. Um, you know, at least at Keller Williams, we find that it's easier uh, sometimes to partner with the smaller shops in those regards because they have a f they're more nimble and they have a faster um, response time and they're more adaptable to a more um, integrated relationship versus a more traditional. We'll come back in 60 days with the analysis, or we'll come back and with this brief. And you know that the smaller shops seem to be more nimble, if you will. And the example I think that illustrates the the delta best for me on the the cycles of t technology 
versus the cycles of the legal field sure. is when the recently, as, as it was made, you know, obviously uh, a lot of headlines, when Congress was, was interviewing Mark Zuckerberg about, you know, how does Facebook make money? And here this is a fortune, uh, I don't know the exact number of company, but they, one of the largest companies in, in our economics with, you know, billions of users and the, the lawmakers aren't even familiar with the business models. And mm -hmm. I think that that shows you the, the cycle and speed that technology and data and the cycle and speed that the law traditionally as a, as a whole are just, those are two different velocity tracks. And so any shop that can be, can operate more in that capacity and that speed is going to help be a better strategic partner for large companies needing to make quick moves here in the next two or three years to, to, to win. So it's, it's interesting because when you're talking about Keller Williams and I'd say maybe peer companies, ones that are at that size level, you're talking a lot about, about studying data, collecting and studying data and figuring out how to use that data to better the user experience. When we're talking about about lawyers and law firms, and I guess Keller Williams is a consumer of legal services, That's right. you're talking more about response times. Yeah, well, yeah, because so, and this is, you know, you and I spoke on, on the phone before this, but this is where, from a client, a lawyer to me is, is, and, and the legal firm is not a whole lot different than my advertising firm or my accounting firm, or th these are all just div um, uh, shared services that uh, help me achieve my business objectives. And I've got a PNL on, you know, how do we how do we achieve my business objective as uh, fast as possible to the highest degree as possible to to win. And speed right now is one of our metrics because we're getting pressure on lots of uh, fronts. And so when um, when we talk to and evaluate our our legal um, partners, um, that is an extremely important metric. Whether it be our, our IP attorneys, whether it be um, and here's an example. So. So, for instance, the we, Boeing is in the news recently because they had software that convinced the plane that it needed to go down, and that created cat, cat, and a catastrophe. We've got technology going into autonomous cars, mm -hmm. and that autonomous car, the software made a decision that ended up killing someone. Um, we've got technology going into pacemakers. We've got technology that's doing open heart surgeries. We've got technology that's going like in every part of our life. Behind each one of those decisions was billions of dollars of capital investments to, to try to leverage technology to take market share. These were features people were building. These are new products people are building. We need an attorney um, in that, uh, or, or a legal presence in that decision making so that we can make eyes wide open decisions. And so if you imagine you've got five companies all trying to build the autonomous car right now. There's an arms race and who's going to get there first. The people that get there first, it's worth, you know, upwards of tens of billions of dollars in market capitalization for them. So the, the value for, and from a legal consultant to that organization is who's going to be the best partner to move at that pace to help them achieve the best product possible, understanding the pros and cons and the legal risk of these decisions. Um, and that's speed to market. Uh, if you could do it across every vertical, whether it be in the aircraft, whether it be medical, whether it be in real estate, like there is a massive push at every vertical in the industry right now um, to create new products, new services, leveraging new data, and the, the organizations that can partner in, in a strategic way to help them make those decisions quickly will win. So let's, let's talk about brass tacks, what we as lawyers can do. And let's try to get some concrete takeaways. Yep in terms of how we need to kind of maybe rethink or reevaluate or study our practices. So we talk about response times, kind of you know, saying, look, we don't have a month to consider this. We have maybe a week. And so it sounds like we as lawyers need to compress our, our analytical time and come back to you with, with faster decisions. Is that fair or unfair? Yeah, I, I mean, I think every every business case is, is unique. I think one of the things that was most so recently, we had a, a business problem, and we went out to three firms, and we and we and we offer recommendations, and they were of all different sizes. There was a small, there was a solo practitioner, there was a small firm, and a big firm, and we gave them all the same problem. And the what was interesting was the larger firm spent a lot of time talking about when we first met, talking about their 
credentials in, in their process. The small firm t did some, kind of a hybrid, did an analysis of what we were doing plus what um, they were doing. And the solo practitioner who we ended up award awarding the work to and are still in a relationship with came back and actually changed the whole conversation. They said, what's your business objective? What are you trying to accomplish in the first meeting? And so we had a whole conversation in the first meeting around what we were trying to accomplish. And then they came back and talked about how they were gonna be a member of that team, how they could be our team helping us achieve that objective. And so we awarded the work to them because they were able to, we felt, best position and to join us on our journey of being a, uh, you know, achieving our business objective. So I would say response times, of course, but I think every client always universally will always say they want faster results. I think that's gonna be a, a maxim. I think the, the one thing that I would say from my experience that is as the world's getting hazier and hazier around um, data and technology and innovations, the, 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 the firms or the attorneys that can actually partner as a strategic advisor um, and, help you, and help you navigate this very murky area and help you make calculated decisions as almost like an extension of your team and understanding your business objectives are going to win. And I think that's a, my personal experience. So let's, let's maybe talk about the difference then between, say, a lawyer versus a business partner. It's, it sounds like that's kind of the, the terms we're using there. So you've got, you've got a lawyer who kind of gives you legal advice, and you've got a partner who's using their legal degree to help Keller Williams further a business objective. Right? That seems to be the, the two sides of the coin. So let's say you, you went with a business problem to a lawyer, and then you took that same business problem to a partner using that terminology. What do you expect to be the difference between the two responses that you'd get from them? I mean, you alluded to it earlier, but let's, let's try to drill down into that. So, you know, at least I've, I've heard it many times that, you know, oh, I don't want to go to my lawyer because my lawyer just tells me what I can't do. The lawyer tells me what my risk is. Are your business partners doing something different? Yeah, I mean, so in my very, uh, you know, one perspective of this, Someone going back and doing research and telling me the legal risk is one thing, and I think you can. That's a very transactional, functionary role, in my opinion. Where it elevates, in my opinion, is someone who's actually applying strategic thinking in alignment with your business goals and objectives. And so, the thing I would challenge there is, I want a legal firm to be my partner. I want my partners to be baked in their in their domain expertise. So if I'm talking to uh, an accounting firm, then I want to tell the accounting firm what my objective is. I don't want them just to count, you know, tell me where I spent the money. I, I can do that relatively easily. I want someone to come back and give me strategic guidance on where they think I could be doing this better. I want the law firm to come back and do the exact same thing. I, whatever the professional services that I'm in relationship with, I want them taking their expertise, which is law in this case, and then applying it to be my strategic partner to help me achieve my business outcome. And, and that's what I seek out. Okay, we've got some questions in the audience. Yes, sir. How did uh, to go to? Let me, let me repeat the question for those that are listening in. The question is, what what did Keller Williams use? What kind of data did it use to, to narrow down on, on the big firm, the smaller firm, and the solar practitioner in the story that, that Josh had told us earlier? Is that a, is that a fair summary? Okay, yes. Josh? Yeah. So um, we, we looked at two um, KPIs. The first was we asked them to benchmark what they believed the run rate would be over a quarter ba every, every quarter to achieve that, the engagement. And so we looked at what that, we thought that would be a blended you know, hourly rate would be. And so we evaluated the, the cost versus deliverable. Um, and then and second- K And KPI, for those that don't know, means- Sorry, key performance indicator. So okay. if key we basically- we say, here's this project, and here's the funds we have to, to fund this project, uh, and here's the timetable we have, and here's what the business outcome is. So then when we talk to each firm, the, the, as any business will do, we evaluate what the cost analysis was of using each one of those firms. And there was a little bit of a price discrepancy, but not much, to be candid. The, um, the second one, which was the one that was m the burn rate, if you will, or how much we were spending every month wasn't going to change very much. The difference was the deliverables we were going to get each month for that spend. Um, and the smaller firm was able to, I mean, a, a material impact, give us more throughput of, of, of work product out for that same spend. So that's why we, uh, we, we felt we could go faster, move faster um, with the solo practitioner. But how did you determine that? Up front, because you don't know yet until you engage 
in, in, un, unless you'd engaged all three, you wouldn't necessarily know which one gave you the best deliverable. So how well, did the best deliverable is different? So the, so we didn't obviously have a quality uh, we didn't have a quality measurement. So we did the typical stuff we called references, and we looked at their past work product. The only two metrics we had to make a decision was the price per hour blended rate type type uh, calculation, and then based off of the estimate of what they believed they could get us on a monthly basis for the first quarter, we could look at the how much are we getting in the first quarter with each partner based off their estimate, um, and what would that blended rate look like? And so we can evaluate. This is we're going to get this much work product for this much money, and then we looked at their past work product, um, and we looked at uh, references to, to to try to determine quality. And how did you determine the quality of what their work product would be? Because with most lawyers, you know, we we pride ourselves. Our general counsel did that. I mean, so our okay. our, our our general counsel and legal team looked at their past work to evaluate standards. And how did you figure out who you were going to invite to, to kind of bid on this work? Yeah, we, we were all references. So we went out and um, our, our legal team had references. So we reached out and we've got three names. We invited them all in. We gave them all the exact same question. And then um, we uh, went from there. We've got another question over here. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, how do we how do we take all these concepts that we have been discussing, and how do we use that to help us build our businesses to get more clients? So I, I will tell you, uh, it's slightly hard for me to answer because I'm not a, a in in the practice of, of of finding clients to service from a legal profession. However, I will tell you what I would do because it's very similar to what I did at Omnicom, where I created a, a, a division of around innovation. I would. I would recognize that every single company right now across the planet is trying to figure out what they're going to be doing uh, with technology. And you see this in, in fancy words, digital transformation, um, AI and data driven, connected consumer experiences. You see all of them moving in this play. The startups are trying to figure this out. The SMB is trying to move up. The Fortune 50s are trying to defend against disruptors. And so I would pick a, a, a vertical that you're comfortable in or that you have some, some in, if you would. And I would I'd figure out what the case studies are or, or what those implications are going to be for that industry and then go and partner with those firms around navigating those very tricky issues. So for instance, here's the question to every company is asking right now from a legal perspective. Every company is on an arms race to get as much data as possible. What's the liability of holding that data? What's the uh, regulation that California is trying to push right now around data rights and privacy and that just happened in Europe? What are those ramifications, implications going to be on me and my business? What do I should I be doing right now to mitigate my financial and legal risk over the, my, my next two or three year plan that I'm having where I'm wanting to still acquire more data to create better experiences, either to, if I'm B2B to find better um, clients and service them better, or if I'm B2C to help create better consumer experiences. That's... These are the, the problems and, and challenges that every large organization is facing right now. And the companies that can actually help you navigate that and have a line of sight on here's what we believe the implications are going to be on your, in your industry and on your company are the ones where I was saying earlier, I think that's where the smaller shops will have some of an advantage and for a few years until the, I believe, like in most things, uh, in a few years, every large firm will have a practice dedicated to this that is mature and robust. And I think that there's just, there's just a great area right now where all these companies are moving really fast to try to get into the space. And there's a lot of uncertainty and risk and, and that, that they, need consult, they need professionals help on. So do lawyers need to start learning more about, about data collection, data privacy, and the legal issues surrounding that? Is that, is that kind of a hot area that you think most corporate consumers are going to be are going to be interested in, or is it? Are, are you talking about a different skill set? No, hundred percent. Our number one hires right now in our legal team at Keller Williams is people that have technology background who have helped you know understanding the what you know data collection like, like and this is really and they're some of the hardest attorneys to find. Like we are in desperate need for really smart legal minds that understand um, as the world's moving in, into this world, what are all the legal impl implications of that? And also, it's such a gray area right now. There's so much legislation happening in so many different areas. Who, who's keep, we need someone who can keep track and a pulse on that and tell us what the implications are. And, and I'm, 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 I feel pretty confident saying I believe that's happening across every sector, every industry right now. I don't think that's unique to Keller Williams or to real estate. 
Oh, we've got a question in the back. Okay, so the question is, how is Keller Williams using, using the data that we've been talking about at the agent level to try to go out and find clients. More, find more clients or customers for Keller Williams? And then maybe from that, we can try to glean something that we as lawyers can, can take home with us. So, Josh. Yeah, so one of the first things we did was we allow agents, each agent has their own kind of database. If you think of an agent, they're their own business, their own kind of SMB um, business. So... The average agent has about 330 people in their database. Um, that ranges, obviously, but that's like the, the average. And we allow them to tag who in their database is an active client versus a past client versus they've never done business. And then we've actually allowed them to upload that database into Facebook. Um, and then Facebook, we actually do what they call is a lookalike model. So we can say people that are this old in this area that have these characteristics based off of your database are more likely to, to answer your phone call, answer your email, get back to you, and then ultimately be in relationship with you. And then we would buy programmatic ads on Facebook on behalf of that agent to people that, are, that look most like people they've done business with in the past, if, that, if this makes sense. And so this allows them to get a really efficient advertising spend. So instead of having to spend $50 for just random impressions of getting your ad out there on Facebook, that same $50 can go very targeted to people that are statistically much more likely to be in a relationship with you as an agent. Um, we've also had done a data, I don't know if this one's applicable or not, but we've also done a lot of data work with um, uh, third-party firms that collect things like um, buying behavior, life events, so that we can understand. We've mapped it back and says, these are the three things that are most likely to trigger someone being in the real estate market. And so we call that the kind of the moment of, tr uh, you know, moment of truth or the moment zero, which is they start the process. And so we want to trigger our advertising and campaigns on those events so that they can be, because you know, like anything, right, the, fat, the closer you get to the transaction and the more likely that person is, like other people have worked with you, your higher your conversion rates are going to be. All right, so Josh, an another question we have from the audience is that in the legal profession, you know, you've been talking about data and how in the business world, outside of the legal industry, there's a lot of data being collected. And in the legal profession, we can get access to data. You can go to the courthouse and you can see who's filed cases, whether those cases have settled, you know, wh which cases are going to jury. If you're on the criminal side, you can figure out who's been indicted, what have they been indicted for. There's, there is data out there. So is that the kind of data that in your view, you think lawyers should be using when trying to harness data for purposes of their businesses? Or are you talking about something maybe a bit different? Bad answer, I know, but kind of all the above. And what I mean by that is there's two, I, I hear kind of two themes, which is depending on if you're trying to get better you know, demand generation or conversion. So uh, you're gonna use data in different capacities. Uh, I'm going to talk about the conversion because that's the simplest, the simplest one to talk about. I believe that the partner that shows up with the most insights from the data wins the deal in a magnitude above the, the competition. I think a lot of organizations, I'm going to guess, um, a lot of uh, firms are going to be what I consider data rich but insight poor. And that is, I think, a challenge that the world is facing as we are being inundated with more and more data. So when we have reams and reams of data, the big question is, so what? And who can answer that question meaningfully related to that business or industry, I believe, is what I, as what I was alluding to earlier, saying that now, now you've entered into being kind of a partner, helping me understand what's going on, and I think your conversion rates will go up um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the opportunities that you get. The second part of that question is demand gen, like how to use the data to get in front of more people. And I think that's a very nuanced answer, depending on you know, what your, what your, the, the type of law you practice, what market you're in, what channels you're in. But I would say, again, I, the related here is, um, this is a cheesy example, but uh, I think it'll illustrate the point the Fitbit is just a pedometer, right? It's just, just count your steps. And no one actually believes that it counts every step right. But my wife wears her Fitbit religiously every day because it answers a question, does she walk more today than she did yesterday? And it made her smarter about herself. That's kind of like that quantified self. Zestimate with Zillow, since I'm in real estate, 
No one actually believes that dollar amount's right. But what they do believe is that it trends right and that if it, whatever it's wrong, it's wrong across all their homes. So they all, we all check it, we all look at it because we wanna see is my home worth more than my, than my neighbors? Did my home value go up or less? And so it made you smarter about yourself. Whoever can use the data to make you smarter as a business person is going to win. And I would use that strategy to get more business, to more appointments and to help my conversion rates. How, what data you use and how you derive those insights and how you deploy that to do those things are gonna be very dependent, in my opinion, on the type of law you practice and where you practice that law. But that's how I'd answer that question. So what, what I love here is that, is people always complain when lawyers say it depends, but you've said it's, it depends. It's dependent on so many things. We, I, okay, you're, 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 you're honorarily one of us now. <laughs> so we, we'll, we'll give you an honorary adaptable lawyer, JD. So a, another question that, that popped up, and I think it's related to what to what you just said is, you know, lawyers have these rules and we're not allowed to go and solicit business. We can't just go off the street and say, hey, you look like, you know, I, I, I did some research on you and your neighborhood and it looks like you might get sued. So here's my card if you ever do, or you might want to sue your neighbor. You know, we, we just, we're not allowed to do those things. So if attorneys cannot ethically solicit clients, how do we use this type of data? And I'm not asking you to give a legal opinion, but kind of thinking as a business person, you know, we're not allowed to go and tell people, hey, we can make you smarter about who you were until they come to us effectively. Yeah. So what, what, th that's a challenge, I think, for this industry. I actually think why, like, in this case, and I actually do believe that if, you know, the attorneys that can, or the firms that can put together quick, easy reads on what the, what this stuff will have as an impact, or if someone can take that data and turn it into insight and say, here's the so what at the high level, as a white paper or as a one pager and send that just as a, a hey, here's some information you may want to know as a business, as a business. like I, I've received a couple of those recently and that actually, I, I personally stopped and read them because- You actually read them? I, I did, I mean, okay. I, because I'm looking to get smarter about this very hazy space and I believe that to be a universal truth. I believe every company is looking to get smarter right now about this very, very evolving space. Like I understand the technology at a high level, I understand the consumer impact at a high level. I think we as an organization are still trying to figure out what the legal ramifications are gonna be and what's happening across the country with other real estate companies or other companies like us similarly situated doing these things. I think that that, uh, um, I personally think that there's there's value there. So we were talking earlier about about you know data privacy and the data privacy laws. So if somebody was to was to go do some research and and send a white paper to you and your general counsel that says you know hey look there's there's something coming down the pike or there's you know I've I've been doing some research on X Y and Z methodology and I think there's a lawsuit brewing and so. Here's, here's, what, here's what I think the basis of the lawsuit would be. Here's how I think you'd possibly defend against it. Please call me if that ever happens. Is that something that you'd be interested in seeing? Because you've just talked about data. I mean, is that, is that kind of an example that? Yeah, and I think it could even be more uh, high level than that. I mean, to be honest, I mean, like, for instance, here are four cases that you maybe want to know about and, and how it could impact, you know, what, and, and, and what it can, the impact could be to the real estate industry as a whole. Or here's three things that other companies trying to da 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 Like, that is, Material and then our general counsel would have a conversation with them and they would uh, you know go from there. I think that but that's a real again we are our number one legal hire right now is trying to staff up technical lawyers. We're looking for uh, partners that, to help us shore up that side of it. Like there, that is like a real need we have. So and I think that's not going to be just us. I think that's across every. Because here's a fear that I think a lot of lawyers have is. I write this one pager, I do all this work, give you this one pager, and I send it to you, and your general counsel says, okay, that's interesting, puts it away in his or her drawer, and then when the time comes, Keller Williams just calls up its, its law firm that it has on retainer and says, oh, here's this white paper, by the way, so go ahead and, and build, up, build off upon this. It sounds like you're not saying that. You're saying you'd go to the source, the person who sent you the white paper, yeah, and so, but, talk to that but person. Yeah, so, but this is, it's all, it's, I mean, of course you're gonna have, you're not gonna have 100% conversion rate, right? Right, of course. So right. the, there's gonna be a, a um, depending on the, where that company is and what relationship that company has, um, you're gonna have a different conversion rate. That being said, that white paper is gonna be also, very valuable when you're actually in front of someone. And you're, so I wouldn't think it's wasted because when you're actually in front of a, a, a client talking about their needs, and you can pull out saying, well, we've done a quick analysis of this and here's what we found in that first conversation. Well, now you're turning that same data, that same insights, and now you're trying to help your conversion rate. Again, uh, I've said this before, but I just believe that 
the, any company is, is looking how to go from um, data rich to insight poor and to get to that kind of so what and people that can translate that is better. I don't want to let myself off the hook though. There was a gentleman that asked a question. Yes, and yes. He asked about why am I getting solicited and spammed by realtors? And um, so I will answer that one because uh, I'll take you know, every question. The answer to that is that realtors are very creative and uh, <laughs> they're very aggressive. And that being said, Keller Williams is we're just a, a, a franchise. So we every kind of like McDonald's, like every real estate office is independently owned and operated, and then every realtor is an independent contractor within that independently owned franchise. So I can't speak for all Keller Williams agents, much less every realtor, but I will say that real estate is, a, is an aggressive um, field, and that's probably why that journal is. I think the concern there is that for lawyers, we can't be that aggressive. There are rules in place that kind of regulate how, you know, quote, aggressive we can be when it comes to that. So. You know, it, it's 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 going to be food for thought. There's a question in the middle of the room. Yes, my name is Joseph Jacob, and before I can potential client, how do you charge the job? Do y'all have any updates on that? So, so the the question, and 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 this is actually from from Joseph Jacobson. So, shout out to. Shout out to Joseph. He he was on the advertising review committee for the state bar of Texas, and. He's given us this, this this very good example of years ago there was a plane crash in Dallas. I think it was it was it a Love Field or was it DFW? But it, it was it was a it was a big plane crash. And the rule was that as opposed to going to the hospital and trying to look at plane crash victims and saying here's my card. Everybody might remember that from the movie The Rainmaker with with Matt Damon. You can't Matt Damon them. You can't go go out and do that. What you what you could do though is take out a big ad in the Dallas Morning News and say I'm a plane crash lawyer. You know, I, I, I specialize in that. Now, getting back to what we've been talking about, Josh, it's, it sounds like what, what, what Joseph is suggesting is that maybe what we do is when we know that there's an issue brewing, you can always send out a targeted letter perhaps and say, look, I know you've had this happen to you. And if you need help, call but me. This is the perfect example. So again, I don't know the, the, all the rules around advertising around being an attorney. So, so take this with that context. But Many like, of us instance, don't either. <laughs> For instance, the, the, the idea that I want to get into more will business, without knowing that business well, I would be extremely surprised if there wasn't early indicators on life events that trigger people to go, I should have a will, such as marriage, birth, grandparents dying, parents dying. Like I believe there's going to be some life events that would trigger that thought. Facebook is the, basically the centralized source of truth around life events. And so I would absolutely have an advertising campaign um, and I would create four different campaign inside of Facebook around those different life events, targeting people by those life events with specific copy and messaging that says, and then this is where I would use the data insight. So I would have a campaign that said, did you know some insight from the data around being the expert around wills targeted to people that just had children? Did, you know, around how much money gets lost that doesn't transfer down to their children because they didn't have a will. I don't know, I'm making this up. I would do the exact same thing across all those segments and I would go to this, the, where I could get that data and I would, I would completely have a targeted campaign around those moments of truth. The, same thing with SMB. So if I was looking if in the SMB area, I would target companies um, in LinkedIn with LinkedIn ads and then I would try to cross-reference that in Facebook to those same people. So you can actually, in case, again, I'm just kind of geeking out for a quick second, but I, you could easily, within 15 minutes, guys, yourself, set up a campaign in LinkedIn that says, I want to target these types of people that have these types of roles in my area, and then you can cross-reference that same list into Facebook so that, because that, that same general counsel also checks his Facebook feed or her Facebook feed. And you can be putting your message in front of them around things that are happening in their industry or companies similar to them. And again, you're not gonna get 100% conversion rate, but I believe you'd get a better ROI from a campaign like that than traditional segments. So the innovation there is about, is about how you target people that might be germane to your law practice, it sounds like, as opposed to, as well as changing how you practice law. It's really a matter of how to get your message in front of the right people. Is that, is that fair? I mean, that's, I think that's what every company right now is trying to figure out how to do, is how they, how they use data to use their marketing dollars more effectively um, and more targeted to get better conversions. We have another question in the back. Yeah, can I follow up on that? You can digitally go after those people. Okay, so this is, this is more of a comment about how, how if it's informational, educational, it falls outside of the advertising rules. So effectively, it's agreeing with, with what you're saying, Josh, that 
you know, you can reach out to somebody if you know that they had a major life event. You know, they just bought a house. And, and so you say, well, here's some things you might need from a legal side to protect it, whether it's a will or, you know, if it's an insurance agent saying, hey, have you, do, do you have the right protections for your house, and, whatever it is. And that's to consumers. I think, I think it's just as applicable to, to B2B. If, you're, if you focus on businesses, again, at the end of the day, those are just the same people, and, and they're, they're, they're going through the same thing. But instead of those life events, you're going to look for industry events or business events. There's going to be early indicators across every event that says this company, whether it be a growth pattern, a decline pattern, more press around them, there's going to be early indicators that will give you some inkling that these people are going to be relatively more willing or less willing to talk to us based off data. Like, that's a universal truth. The question and the, what, where people win or lose is who can derive that data for their segment and apply it in the most meaningful way uh, against their competitors. So it's interesting because, you know, really, I think for most lawyers, we, we, tend to be, we tend to be a bit shy about coming off as salesy, right? We don't want to come across as salespeople. And so when you talk about a LinkedIn campaign or a Facebook campaign, at first blush, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but at first blush, it sounds like it's not like we're trying to do cold calling with people. And we've all had that experience, I think, where you connect with somebody new on LinkedIn, you don't really know them, and then within seconds, you get, you get a message in LinkedIn that tells you to buy their product, right? They say, oh, well, listen, can I have a quick 15-minute call to tell you about why you need my internet marketing or whatever it is? And most people, I think, kind of tend to ignore those. But we don't want to be that. As lawyers, we want to be the person that feels, we, we, want, to, we want the recipient of our LinkedIn message to say, oh my gosh, this is, this is such timely. Yeah. So, so how, how, do you, how do you think you, well, you thread was, that needle? What you're asking is different demand generation strategies. So I was, I was answering specifically the question sure. of how do I go find new business clients? Sure. The only way to find new business clients that aren't in your sphere of influence or in your referral network is you've got to have some cold introduction in some case. And then I personally would try to do mitigate my wasted energy and increase my conversion, use data and digital because it's cheaper advertising costs and allows you to have higher target messaging, which gives you better conversion. So that was, now whether or not that's the right lead generation strategy, that's a fair conversation. With real right. estate, it's, it's actually a low performer. The best performer is referrals and warm referrals. I think that's probably going to be true in most fiduciary relationships. So you still need people. <laughs> you, still, you, you still need human beings talking uh, to other human beings. So again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't run a practice, but in the, in the real estate field, which is a highly, highly considered transaction that has a fiduciary, money spent in then growing and, and nurturing your, your, your database or your, your current clients and your referrals to those clients will outperforms every other lead generation by a magnitude of 10. And, and so I would, I would imagine real estate's probably similar, which is, again, if you have someone and doing something to invest in a, making them more inclined to introduce you, that's going to be a really good lead generation strategy. But again, I don't know everyone's, you know, where they are in their business. So whether or not cold, you know, direct marketing and cold, cold advertising is the, uh, the most effective strategy, that's a different conversation. To answer the specific question of how do we use data to find new clients, that's the only answer to that. The, I think those are two different questions. But it's interesting because when you talked about how you identified the firms that you went out to in that, in that KPI study you were doing earlier, you mentioned that your general counsel had gone out, reached out to people that, that he knew and got names. That's right. So at the end of the day, there were warm referrals that led to that process. That's so, right. And I believe that to be true. I believe that to be true in every highly considered transaction. I believe that people like doing business with people they feel comfortable with. And referrals rival has social proof. So another way you could use the same strategy within your referrals is is use the same data and then identify who you're connected to, right? Obviously that works at companies that are similar using that data that they would be triggering. So uh, I would, again, I think there's two different conversations here. One is how do you, what's the best way of actually growing your business? And the second one is how you use data to find new clients. And I think those are slightly two different conversations. Well, this is, this is definitely food for thought, but unfortunately that is all the time we have for, for today. I, I think we could go on and on, but I want to thank my guest, Josh team for joining us. And I of course want to thank you for tuning in. And I want to thank our, our in-studio audience for being here. Let's give yourselves a round of applause, everybody. Yes. We have some great questions. This podcast is brought to you thanks to the generous support of LawPay. So yay, LawPay, go check them out. If you like what you heard today, please rate us and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, life's a journey, folks. I'm Rocky Deer, signing off for now.
If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to TexasBar.com slash podcasts. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.